Welcome to Rally Bites Radio on the 20th of March 2014. Uh, yesterday was Budget Day, of course, and uh, we were down in Parliament um, watching the, the circus that is the mainstream media, uh, supposedly um, covering the events of the day, but um, all controlled by the BBC. But uh, we'll talk about that on Monday in the news segment and uh, other things that went on that day as well. And my adventure today, uh, travelling, it's another story. But anyway, we have uh, Alan Watt on the line. And uh, Alan's been off here for a while, and he, he put a little um, post on his website on the 20th of February, uh, basically saying that uh, he's he was living under the, the worst winter he's ever seen in Ontario, and it was down to minus 40, shoveling snow, and uh, they call it global warming, I believe. Uh, you there, Alan? That's right, Jim. And, it, and it's been pretty cold since November. I haven't seen... Uh, the snow's been here since November, by the way, still snowing. And... Uh, uh, the temperatures were in the sub-zeros from November quite frequently right through to the present time. Just last week, I was hitting 35 below. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, of course, um, I've, I've spoken on here before about uh, what we're doing down in Somerset, and we're actually making a documentary about the whole thing. And the people down there are actually starting to, to understand that, that that flooding is not an accident. Uh, the previous floods weren't accidents. And they're actually talking now about Agenda 21. And I've had... Uh, Interestingly, I've had a couple of engineers, environmental engineers and consultancy groups down there um, call the office and, uh, you know, ask ask what we're about and uh, what the documentary is going to be about and what angle we're coming from. And uh, I've mentioned Agenda 21 to them a couple of times and uh, they didn't really know anything about it. They'd heard about it, but um, they didn't know anything about it. But now they're starting to look at it and uh, coming back to me and say, you know, um, some of the stuff they're doing here is, uh, is, is very similar to what you've just told us on Agenda 21. And I says, well, that's because that's what it is, you know. That yeah. this is deliberate policy. So we we had an email exchange, you and I, and um, we wanted to do really the whole kind of history where all this uh, greenism, if you want to call it that, came from. And uh, I, I mentioned to you before. I, I remember reading a book by H. G. Wells in which he talked about energy being a currency in the future, yeah. and that was back in the the twenties, nineteen twenties. So, I mean, it, it goes back a long, long way, and uh, many, many, many people um, believe this only came out of the, the Rio summit, but um, it was on to go a long, long time before that. Do, do you want to, I mean, go back to the, the very start of it? Well, we can go back, way back, in fact, to the time when, when even um, you, you'll find uh, that Britain really was the first country to have recorded, and I think it's much older, but they had recorded uh, uh, corporations, in big corporations, like the British East India Company, you know, and, uh, and that was to do with trade. The whole idea of that was to bring in a, a system of free trade, uh, which wasn't free at all. It was to limit the market to, to their own traders by joining treaties, etc. And uh, going back to the 1500s and the 1600s, and that took off big time. So that, the idea was very old. John Dee talked about to the British Empire with free trade. And he presented it to, 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 the, to the, uh, the Queen as well. Uh, so he, a bright, he called it Brightish, B-R-Y-T, Brightish Empire, the free trade. The idea being that those who signed on to it would have to adopt that British system of government, you see, uh, a monopoly, a commonwealth of nations. And that's the whole idea that you had later on, too, with the New Atlantis, with Bacon, etc. So it was a corporate thing, for monopolization. Uh, this has gone down through the centuries, the same idea. Uh, you'll find that the crown of England, for instance, and all other crowns, for that matter, across Europe, all related, they all have these crown corporations. Uh, crown corporations are, are difficult things to, to even, for even uh, companies that, that are, are government-owned, like the CBC Canada, very much like the BBC, uh, to investigate, because they can't get past the outer shell of what exactly it is, Partly there's limited partnership or, or, or um, there's limited uh, shares for it. It's not given to the public. Uh, we know that the Queen of England for, or the King in George Orwell's day, his dad worked for the, one of the corporations in Burma when they ran the British Opium Company. And uh, his dad was in charge of it. And that came out in the 1920s in the British Parliament. And they found out that it was a complete monopolization. Only a royal family and the members of the royal family uh, and some of the top bankers had uh, shares in it. It wasn't offered to the public. The British folk at that time thought it was abolished, but it wasn't. And it was a politician named P. Paul Thompson, I think his name was, 
They brought it up in Parliament, and it was time everybody was still on the go. So, monopolization is an idea. In the late 1800s, their man and, and they had their own guys in the U.S. for a long time to, to create the, the similar um, partnerships or deals for this international monopolization of all trade, including all energy, of course, and so on. And Rockefeller was the guy that they used for that one. And uh, he, he was one of the robber barons, of course, strategically placed, and his son was coached and trained for his role. Then he eventually became the, the, the oil baron for the States. He took over all, all oil through all means possible. It's incredible uh, the network uh, 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 that he had. He had his own intelligence service worldwide to be ahead of everybody else's game. Um, he had to be, once they, they deregulated it under the antitrust laws, yeah, Standard Oil, and the reason it was called Standard Oil was to standardize uh, all of the oil industry under one, in fact, his system. And uh, he would have shares in all the companies. In fact, they had to pay him off or he put them under. Quite openly, he publicized this, that if you don't join me, I'll put you under. And he did put lots of them under competitors. Other ones were burned out and so on. It's all fear and love and war and business. And uh, that's what they did. But... Uh, uh, so he also was, was a boy to start off the, the, the organization that wouldn't just control all energy, but all policy for the world through amalgamations and treaties, etc. So he became the head of the Council of Foreign Relations when eventually they gave it that name. They had it before under his family, but they didn't have it out in the open. In Britain, they had it before, as we well know, with Alfred, Lord Alfred Milner. And, uh, we, and uh, the, the Cecil Rhodes Foundation, along with uh, Lord Rothschild, uh, etc. And they became the Royal Institute for International Affairs. They couldn't call it Royal Institute for International Affairs in the U.S. It had been outcry, so they called it the Council on Foreign Relations. And then every British Commonwealth country has a, a dep- its own department. You had the Canadian uh, ones for international affairs, Australian, New Zealand, uh, the Eden India, in fact, they left a big one there too and other ones across the old British Empire. Still on the go, of course, and still working towards the same agenda. And their idea was to create a, uh, a, the world as it should be run by them, naturally, and their offspring. Uh, the intelligentsia, the wealthy intelligentsia, should rule the world. Quite simply, that was it. And they'd proven that they were the wealthy intelligentsia by holding on to their money for generations, uh, marrying for good breeding as opposed to any other reason. Good breeding and money, of course, always marries itself. And that was your certificate of good breeding, the fact that you had the good money. So uh, it's, a, it's a monopolization of all the world, all of its resources, etc. They funded, as we all know, the communist revolution through the bankers. Uh, a, a lot of other, the big bankers got on board with them because they had their own agenda at one point. And uh, so they funded the Soviet Union as, as a kind of uh, uh, an enemy. To get progress, as you call it, you must have an enemy. You see, you must have a... If there's no enemy, everything will be static. People love uh, a system that's been born into that doesn't change. We're like that. That's a that's human nature. We get used to, to whatever conditions we're in, even when we're slaves. And so to, to change things in a certain direction, you must plan the outcome. And how do you get to the outcome that you want? Well, you must have an opposition that complains. You have skirmishes, uh, verbal battles, whatever, or even physical ones. Then you have compromise. And, of course, that's your thesis, antithesis, and so on, and synthesis. And you plan the synthesis. That's the whole idea of oppositions. That's what Russia was built up to be. We know for a fact that private companies ran Russia through the Soviet Union. We know that families from New York and other places in the States flooded over there, went back to Russia. Actually, they didn't come from, from, mainly from Germany, but they went to Russia and they became the, the major domos and they ran it right through until, until it supposedly collapsed, which it didn't, of course. So the idea was to create a, a complete united Europe. And they thought if the people would go along with the Russian idea first, they could do it quicker. But it didn't work out that way, so they went to the long haul instead. They wanted a, a united Americas. They wanted a far eastern conglomerate eventually to be built up with China at the head of it, at least the appearance of the head of it. Uh, Karl Marx talked about it. Many others talked about it later on from the same big foundations. And these, these big bankers, these ones who belong to the Council of Foreign Relations, Rockefellers and so on, they, they set up these foundations to, to create all, 
all the oppositions for everything. Lenin said it. He said, how, to, how, how you eliminate opposition is to lead it ourselves. Rather than wait for a real opposition to start, because you're going to do something, it's going to cause opposition, you put out the leaders there, and you train them to be the leaders, and you finance them to be the leaders, and in the public world say, yeah, that's as wrong as join this group, it's ready-made for us, and these people become your leaders. You go around in circles, and you end up in a different place than you ever thought you were going to end up at all. So, old techniques, well, well, well used. Um, they use these, these front organizations, the non-governmental organizations, to demand exactly what they want to be demanded. Uh, and then they, they monopolize the whole business of it, whether it's oil, uh, energy, water, uh, farming. In fact, the head of, of the, uh, the United Nations Agricultural Department said that farming was too important to be left to farmers. And so what they did was they, 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 uh, they created the corporate farms. That was the idea behind it. Small business was to be ultimately eliminated altogether. And that's happened steadily, increasingly steadily since um, the days of Maggie Thatcher. In fact, uh, when half the day for a small business person was filling in forms for governments, you couldn't get your business going that way. They know that too, and the taxation with them as well. Whereas big corporations have teams of lawyers that deal with all the paperwork, they get special discount rates and all the rest of it too, because they the lobby governments for the deals. Uh, the small guys can't do that. So the world that they've planned is, is a total energy market, uh, and that means all goods, services. Everything you need to live on is to be, is to be run by these very old uh, gangs, you might call them, uh, very old families that got together, uh, openly, actually, as I say, in the late 1800s, under a few names that became really one name in the early 1900s. And these are the ones, of course, that Carl Quigley talked about. He was part of it. He, he was all for the agenda, in fact. And uh, you, you find that um, he, he, the only different difference he had was some of the methods, because it's underhand, in, including creating wars to get what they want. And um, and to control all media, and that was a other big part of it too. Uh, the Rockefeller boys in the 1920s and into the 30s uh, had lots of meetings about how to control all the media, and they even and they're, they're fantastic for doing scientific studies. We usually think tanks, etc. That's why they created the Rand Corporation. That was one of the first big ones for them. And um, and and they, they found out that if they control 30 major newspapers in the states, they could control that would control all of the media because they'd all copy the 30 major ones if they owned them. And and so they did that. Nothing's changed. They own them pretty well all today. And so and so you get the, you get the news what you think is news. News doesn't mean truth. Remember, it's just information. And that the court uh, case that went up in the states a few years ago. With a, with a the, the journalistic team that was, that was uh, assigned to Fox News under contract, tried to investigate Monsanto, and of course all hell broke loose, and they tried to cancel their contract, I mean, all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, and, and uh, the judge said, uh, he said, uh, you don't understand, he says the media has nothing to do with telling the truth, it doesn't have to tell the public the truth on anything, and that's just the, the way it really actually is. We've been trained to believe yeah, this well, information, just, just... which is true. But, but it's, that's the furthest thing from the truth, you know. Yeah, just yeah. just to step in there. I mean, we were, I mentioned off here to you earlier that we were down in Parliament yesterday, in the uh, the official um, press area right opposite in College Green, and we mm-hmm. we got a couple of people to come in and talk about the the Bradbury Pound. They, they didn't have press cards, of course, but so we had we had to bring them in to interview them in front of the House of Parliament, and um, we weren't allowed in until we were vetted by the the BBC producer. And uh, we weren't allowed to hand any leaflets out to the other major um, news outlets there. Um, he had to do it, the BBC producer. Yeah. And every live feed mm-hmm. that came came from Parliament that day had to go through the BBC. Every one of them. Yeah, yeah. That's your official censorship department. Yeah. You see, the British uh, Empire uh, set up a, a BBC organisation in every country. Uh, and in Canada, they call it the CBC. And Australia is the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. These are all, these are the these are government controlled uh, media outlets that for the official, but they want official news, they call it, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so so they, they took over the, uh, well, the energy markets, the, the the natural resources of the planet, the water, as you say, uh, the coal, uh, diamonds, silver, gold, all of it. 
Um, but w was there a point where they they thought, okay, we, we've we've secured enough of this stuff, um, whatever in whatever industry it was or whatever um, commodity it was, and then then they took another step towards where we're heading now down down the Agenda Twenty One road. Was there a point? It is, it is, it is, it is, it is, there's many levels all working at the same time for the same organisation, and this is the, they've written about it extensively how it's done in your own books and publications, especially from those who, who are involved in these big foundations. Um, and when they're retired, love to write their memoirs, but they tell you that um, they know that many different aspects of the of their agenda will take different time periods to fulfil. So they're all on the go simultaneously, but all are controlled at the top to make sure they can start to mesh along the way. Uh, again, Quigley said the same thing about foundation. He said, governments can come and go. If the, if the governments were actually real, if, they're, if, they were, if they were once in history they were actually real, which they're not, uh, they're not really what you think they are, um, then you would have to keep, you have major changes all the time in different parties coming and going. And, and changes in policy, and even uh, old policies thrown out the window, and new ones put in. Doesn't happen that way. You see one agenda continuously, and foundations are even better because a foundation can be set up, and I could set up maybe 500 foundations. Each one would have its part to play, and one foundation might might be take over all energy. Uh, one one foundation might. Their job might be to create socialism across the world, the appearance of socialism, which is actually destruction of everything which is independent of them, in actual fact. Uh, socialism does not mean what the average person thinks it means. And, and, and so the foundation can go for 100 years, or, or 150 years, hiring, retiring, hiring, and all, all through, but the same agenda to fulfill this goal. It's got one policy, you see. There's no opposition coming in there. It's one policy until they fulfill it. So some parts of the agenda would take uh, 150. That's why H.G. Wells and, uh, and uh, Shaw and the rest of them created the, 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 uh, the Fabian Society to do the, the Fabian method as opposed to the communist method. They realized that the communist method wouldn't take off in Britain. Uh, and, so, and so these very rich people, and backed by the Astor family, the multimillionaires, um, Created, uh, 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 they would be the leaders of socialism, you see. So, and they said that uh, it might take a hundred years uh, to the millennium before they actually see anything to, uh, that the goals start to actually materialize. So they're, they're counting on the year 2000 or so. And, uh, and again, Lord Bertrand Russell talked about it too. Uh, he works along with the Macy Group and the, the Frankfurt School who were told to work after World War II together to create a new culture for the West, including America and Britain. And, to, and the intention was to destroy all the old values to bring in these new values, where people would actually think they were freer, by the way. And, and uh, by doing that, um, you could then gradually, ch once you're into change, you can keep changing more and more, 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 more frequently uh, and, and speed up your agenda, which they've done. Well, he was involved in creating the culture that was to come out in the 1960s uh, by using the Macy Group, the Frankfurt School, and all the rest of them, and putting university uh, professors through all the universities in, in the West, which actually a lot of them came from, the, from the, uh, the Russia and different countries like that, Soviet Russia. They came right in and got professors' jobs, many of them, or their sons did. So it was all looking together, and people think there's left wing and right wing. No, no, it's one agenda, because the capitalist system suits that of the West, uh, and, uh, and and the communist system also suits the rulers of the West. That's what Quigley said. They said we're often mistaken for the communists. It, the basis is because our agenda is is much the same. Well, actually, it is the same. Uh, a communistic system with massive government bureaucracies and agencies running the general public training us from birth to death, monitoring us from birth to death all through life, uh, and, and, uh, and an elite above them, which Charles Galton Darwin called the wild men, uh, the ultra-rich who, who cannot be trained, they mustn't be trained because they're guiding the world, they mustn't have their minds controlled, they must be free to think and act to make decisions. But everybody beneath them, uh, as they said, uh, won't need even free will because the government will be making all their decisions for them. 
this is a scientific, the scientific system that H.G. Wells talked about. He was a propagandist for them through the Fabian Society. And Bernard Shaw himself said, and you'll see on the Soviet story that very good uh, video, you'll see an old clip of, the, of uh, Bernard Shaw, George Bernard Shaw, uh, saying, when we rule, he says, you'll all have to come to us to justify why we should allow you to live. That's a system and, that we're, we're going into today. Yeah, and he, he, almost here. Yeah. Yeah, he, always, he also mentioned, I think, in that clip, the, um, the big organization of our society, was it? Yeah. Uh, which is which is David Cameron's um, big society, and of, and of course, of course, Cameron is married into the Esther family. So, the Esther family, and, and more than the Esther family, he just gave his genealogy when he gave the speech in Israel last week. Did I didn't hear that. I, I didn't hear that one. No, what, what did oh, he say? Yeah. He, he, he started off with the big bankers. There's a whole bunch of banking families that uh, he he's descended from, and uh, who are well known, by the way. And they rang the Shanghai Bank for them when they were doing all the opium trading through there and so on for his masters, yeah. Yeah. Well, they, uh, we know where the politicians are getting their cocaine then and their opium. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, okay. Moving on. Now, I, I mean, as, as you say, all these uh, groups work uh, at a, a different pace and a different agenda, different parts of the agenda. Um, was there a point they decided, right, we're ready to push this, um, well, the the, the, form, the formulation of agenda, is it, is it time to push this um, because because we have control of so much of the resources that we can actually pull it off? Yeah. I mean, was, was that Rio or was it, did it start happening before that? It, it was happening before that. In fact, you, go, you can actually go ways, ways back in it and you'll find that... Um, Whenever they create a hero in politics, it's generally one of their own boys. And, and, and whatever they put down in the official history books, uh, you'll find it's vastly different from the reality of the period. We know that Standard Oil, for instance, was told to deregulate, and all it did was put them into subsidiaries still owned by the Rockefellers. Still today, by the way. You know. and, um, and that's how everything runs. It's like the big agribusinesses, like the five big agribusinesses, are really all one, the same shareholders. There's no competition at all. Uh, and so uh, they go back into the days, of, 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 as I say, of Theodore, Theodore Roosevelt. And Theodore Roosevelt, he uh, supposedly was a guy who used to champion the, the, the complaints against the Rockefeller's monopolies and tactics by deregulation. So I say it was a, it was a complete sham. He, he simply put in the sub companies that they owned, but it gave him all the votes and, and popularity. But he also started at the same time working for the same boys, the same thing as Rockefeller was doing. He started up the national parks systems where they would put massive chunks aside, etc., supposedly for the wilderness areas, etc. And in reality, they're, they're full of all the oil and, and the gas that they're going to frack shortly, by the way. You know, they knew, these guys knew where everything was way back then. And so there's always an ulterior purpose. Like Bernard Brooks says, whoever to tell the public is forever from politics. He says there's always a good reason, then there's a real reason. That's how it is. So you'll find that Theo Roosevelt really was a big one for pushing that whole movement. The foundations were doing the same thing uh, for for putting aside national parks. They created through the CFR, World Institute of International Affairs. They created the United Nations. That's their that's their baby. They created the Bank for International Settlements. That they run there. Uh, the IMF and they also the they, they run um, a few other or massive organizations. They're the guys who admitted on Canadian television in 2005 that they drafted up the treaty for the integration of Canada and the states in Mexico. A private organization is running the world here. They, we don't vote them in. But most of us have even heard of them. And it was the deputy prime minister of Canada, uh, Lloyd Axford, who was the head of it at the time who'd helped draft up this integration policy for integration of Canada. I mean, what's the point in voting if private organizations are really running the show and drafting up the treaties? By the way, the, 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 their main organization in Britain, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, they're the ones who drafted up the treaty for the, for the, for the whole free trade integration of Europe scheme way back uh, before World War II even ended. Yeah, yeah. So and we're living through a script written by pri these private monopolies. Yeah. yeah, we were just talking about this the other day there in the in the office, and uh, even at the, the council level, 
you know, you ask your councillor to, to help you out with something, they say, oh, well, I've, I've got to toe the party line. Well, well, why did I vote for you then? Yes, it's, yeah. you know, you've you got to, exactly. yeah. you know, we're, 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 we're I mean, talking about... The guy's supposed to represent his own constituents, and the first thing he does when he gets, yeah, you're sorry, i got to, I got to vote with a party. But yeah, what's the point in having them? Uh, of course, the word, par the, the word party is a celebration, so I don't even know where that came from. But, yeah. uh, you know, um, OK, um, we'll go to a, a short piece of music. I have no idea what's coming up because uh, I was in too late tonight to pick the tunes, but uh, I'm sure Steve's got something. And then, yeah, we'll, we'll move on into basically the the whole uh, growth of the green industry, or the green industry, yeah. the green green movement, uh, for want of yeah. a better word. OK, well, we'll take it away, Steve. Welcome back to Reality Bites Radio uh, with myself, Neil Foster, and our guest, Alan Watt, of CuttingThroughTheMatrix.com. Uh, we were talking there before the break about the, the big plan to take over all the resources of the planet, which is, is pretty well done now. Um, of course, there's a, a lot of shale gas around the place, which they're desperately trying to grab a hold of. And um, this is all moving down the road of Agenda 21, which I'm sure many listeners are, are very familiar with. But uh, it's quite amazing that the general public have no idea about this this plan whatsoever. Uh, even the people involved in uh, consultation processes with uh, councils who are who think they're genuinely doing the right thing by uh, making low carbon this and that and the, the next thing. Um, but um, when you speak to them and start uh, giving them some information, they are of a kind of technical background and uh, inquisitive nature, shall we say. And they do start looking at this stuff. And uh, as I was saying earlier, people down in Somerset are now looking at this stuff and beginning to, to see through the, the propaganda of the, the greenies and all the rest of it, saying, oh, well, we've got to spend £3 million on birds, but um, I'm sorry, we can't buy you new carpets. And uh, that's the way it's going. Uh, just uh, last last week, or the week before, I think it was last, yeah, the week before, we had um, Kenny Valenzuela of um, Experimental Vaccines on. And uh, just that week, the British government had announced that they were going to pay out £60 million uh, to GlaxoSmithKline for uh, the damage caused by the swine flu vaccine. Uh, and in the same week down in Somerset, uh, nobody was getting a penny from the insurance companies. So uh, we know where the priorities lie, and uh, it certainly isn't with the people. Never was. No. So, uh, Agenda 21, Alan. Uh, over here now, I've noticed uh, very much so, if you go into the local council's websites, uh, possibly... Three, four years ago, you would never find anything on Agenda 21, and now it's everywhere. They've got yeah. full pages on this stuff, and uh, I wrote an FOI to the local council uh, here, and they wrote back, and th they've got all this local plans, this, that, the next thing, uh, all this stuff they're doing for the environment, and I asked how much you're spending on this, and they said £1,000, which is obviously a lie, because, I mean, it probably cost them more than that for the website. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, uh, th and they're not even... They're, they're not hiding the fact they're doing it, but they're they're hiding what they're doing and couching it in different language uh, yeah. to make to make it sound uh, all fluffy and nice. But um, this this of course all sprang out of uh, the Rio summit and Maurice Strong and um, Mr Gorbachev back in Rio 1992. Uh, but as you say, it's, it's been on the go a lot longer than that. But um, yeah. obviously, obviously that was a point where they thought we can go with this and get away with it, and. Mm -hmm. uh, there's certainly a long way down the road of that now, and the Somerset uh, thing is just an example of it. Um, I, I don't know. Are, are there any kind of major examples similar to that? Not necessarily flooding, but um, other things oh, happening yeah. in your part of the world. Well, I know there's going to be flooding this year, but the snow melts because there's never been so much for since the 1960s, apparently. And um, and the cold temperatures too is great business for plumbers and road workers because uh, there's, there's plumbing going out all over the place, all over the country. And the states too, and uh, but getting back to the the, the, the air summit, I mean, Molly Strong himself was picked up by the Rockefeller himself. Uh, they actually take on proteges. Uh, in fact, I know of a recent one who was picked out of a place in the U.S. The university there, and used to travel with Rockefeller, Rockefeller family uh, wherever they go. They trained them, so they did the same thing with Molly Strong. They picked him up and trained him for his position in the world. Again, an, an, an unelected technocrat, you might say, who gets things done behind the scenes. A big player now, too. But uh, again, the draft for the Rio Summer was written up by the Rockefeller himself. Uh, so uh, he simply presented it to him. But the thing is, it's an ongoing agenda. And Madeleine Albright, uh, Madeleine Albright's uh, grandfather, I think it was, or father, 
uh, was a pal of Stalin. And Stalin uh, talked about the future uh, to, to, and, and said eventually that actually have front organizations which will take over from the Communist Party. Remember, the communism dictatorship still went to last a generation, according to Lenin, which it pretty well did. At that time, it was a 70 year thing, you know, a generation. So uh, he, came, he came up, he was given the first idea to start what was called the Green Party. And then it was put into the States. But it was Madame Albright's relative, who her ancestor, her, her, her granddad, who started it all up. And under the guise, again, of saving the world from us, you see, uh, then uh, they, they, they get the intelligentsia, the, the pre existing foundations, have to have uh, a monopoly over control over all resources. And these foundations, as I say, are simply are the fronts for the most powerful, richest families on the planet. So democracy has never ruled the people, ever, ever. In fact, it's a great sham that stopped a lot of revolutions because you always vote in a new party and you live in hope. But um, <clears throat> it's been a great panacea in a, in a, to an extent. But they hope to train the public. And that, they have been training the public not to even be involved in the, in the, the play-acting of politics. Uh, just accept the fact that experts are ruling the world. And that's, that's happened pretty well since the 60s. That's when... Uh, Russell said that we'll train them, we'll train them to believe the experts and people above them, uh, special people are dealing with all the big problems in the world, just lead them to it and, and, and play yourselves at the bottom. Well, that's kind of society that got us to today. Um, very few folk today, in fact, the, the true statistics are people who bother voting, or it's all low because they, even the folk who don't know the scams that go on, they might see some of them, but they don't know the big picture. They just know it stinks and it doesn't get you anywhere. Uh, it's a con. And getting back to even the days of uh, the American Revolution, you, you find that um, some of the founding fathers uh, uh, in the States said, whatever you see, whenever you, you see, as Jefferson said it, uh, an agenda continue between changes in the House, what they meant of, of politics, of parties. The same agenda continuous, regardless of who gets in, then you know you're under tyranny. And we've been under it for over 100 years. Well, absolutely. I just I experienced a little bit more of that in the airport today, but uh, I'm getting used to it now. Um, the, the, how did... Um, how did Gorbachev get involved, or, or does, is that is that uh, in some way directly linked with the the Albright family and others over there? Yeah, I've no doubt on that. Uh, and Maggie Thatcher, I mean, uh, Maggie Thatcher too had her, her orders. From, it, it, prime ministers and presidents uh, are, are the front people for those behind them. You see, their job is to become unpopular, and that's why they last a certain time and then they're out. Of the bun, they're the their part in the agenda uh, and to get well rewarded for it. So uh, you'll find that Gorbachev, again, KGB guy and the whole thing, I think it was Andropov trained him as well, knew him very well. And uh, uh, they knew uh, that they were to come in to this United Europe idea. Remember, the whole idea was to get all forces to, to get a United Europe where it was communistic or whatever. It didn't matter because it, in reality it would be a monopolization run by the same old folks. And, um, and they got what they wanted. So they knew uh, it was time now to start dissolving, as you said, uh, this dictatorship over the proletariat, that's really what it should be called. And, uh, and the Rees Commission, going back to the 1950s in the U.S., where the Congress got a commission going in to investigate these foundations to find out why the richest corporations in the U.S. were funding what seemed to be left-wing and communistic groups. Uh, if, uh, Norman Dodd was, was the, the, one of the head guys there, and he, he talked to the heads of Ford and Carnegie uh, Institutes, as well as Rockefeller. The guy at Ford uh, said to him, he says, uh, he says, our job is to so change the culture of the West. And culture involves every, all your reality, you know, everything that's normal to you, uh, so that they'll blend seamlessly as uh, education and so on of the youth into the same system, not quite capitalist, not quite communist, exactly the same thing that, that uh, Lenin had said in, uh, at the beginning of his particular reign of terror over there. That, that would last for about a generation and become not quite capitalist and common. The term they're using today is socialist, and they've trained the guys at the bottom to think socialism is something where they pay money in and get something back, but nothing's further from the truth. Socialism is, is, is the type that H.G. That Wells was talking about in Bernard Shaw, 
where an intelligentsia, an elite, a scientific elite, would run on beh- and an academic elite on behalf of the masters, the power men, and so on, would run us uh, like robots, basically, for the good of the world in an orderly fashion. That's where your school to work idea came from. Uh, in the Soviet system, they brought in Pavlov, uh, they, they studied humanity perfectly well, and they said, why, why uh, allow them to, get, to grow up and then choose what they want to work at? Why not just pick what they're good at when they're young, give them uh, 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 tests, you know, and so on, uh, and, and, and train a guy to be a plumber or a carpenter or an electrician, uh, and, and don't bother giving them all the education with history and, and, and geography, what be what be necessary for them, etc. And that's what they were doing there. Now it's the same thing here. They're, they're doing the same thing here in yeah. America. Well, yeah. What, what, what we're getting coming in now is, uh, well, I think it's had three readings. It's not gone to Parliament yet, but uh, the National Service Bill. And uh, uh, anybody in this country with children uh, listening to this, uh, you, your child is going to be taken from you and forced into the military, basically. Um, they've, they've got all this other stuff in there. Or you can you can work for a charity, or you can work for uh, helping the elderly, or or whatever. I mean, I don't know what they're going to help the elderly to do, possibly to die off. But um, yeah. they're certainly killing them off at a remarkable rate over here, as it is. Oh, yeah. But but um, it's uh, how can I put it? It always amazes. I mean, this is a kind of side issue, but it, it, it's amazed me over the last. I suppose especially over the last five years or so. Say. It's how uh, dependent just ordinary people have become on on the most meaningless things. I, I, I remember looking out the window in, in Edinburgh when I stayed up there a few years ago, and there was there was two um, crossings at traffic lights for the roads, and you would see grown adults in, in their early 20s, late 20s, 30s, 40s, um, waiting for somebody in their 70s to come out with a little lollipop and help them across the road. And I, I just thought, what, what is wrong with these people? And, and there was no traffic coming. And it, it reminded me because I, I spent a bit of time in Eastern Europe, and they they will not cross the road until the lights change, and they're told to go. Yeah, uh, it, it was just exactly the same. And yeah. uh, the the children the children here are being taught that as well. And uh, I was on a I was on a flight today, and the language of the stewardesses and and the pilot uh, when they welcome you on board and stuff, it's as if they're talking to to ten year olds. Yeah. It, it's, it's it's demeaning, you know. It's like you know, please disengage your brain before you get on the aeroplane uh, and well, listen to this rubbish. A good thing to do. You mentioned Gorbachev. I mean, he put books out uh, again to popularise him in the West uh, when he was still really the head of the Soviet Union. And this is after his tour with Maggie Thatcher. Remember, Maggie Thatcher was given the job of introducing this new type of communist, this up, this guy, the swinging communist to the West, you know. And they, they, they brought him to London. They, they took him to the, the best tailors and made his, his flashy suits and so on, so he wouldn't drab, etc. Uh, and tried to give him this image. They also made a deal with all the press that came out years later that the press would not ask him any questions to do with the actual system of communism in Russia. Uh, they, all, they were told the topics they could ask uh, him and his wife about, uh, such as uh, free facelifts uh, for women on the, just walk off the street into a, a store and they could have facelifting, all this rubbish, you know, uh, and hairdressing and all the trivia, etc. The same techniques they use in making a star on, on American Idol or whatever. Same cons, uh, same, because it's all run by Hollywood, the, the culture industry. But anyway, they got all the pros over from the States to do that whole PR blitz of this tour with Gorbachev, the, the, new, the new modern communist, you know, to launch him to the world. And then they did a vote in the States afterwards. I think this massive blitz of how great the guy was, giving him interviews on television. And this, they, they said that about 75 of the people liked him so much they'd vote for him in the States. You know? I mean, that's the power of propaganda. You know? That's yeah. how you make any star. But Gorbachev wrote in a book uh, uh, it's, a, it's a coming age or something it was to do with this, this blending of the two systems and if you read those communistic books in the standard communistic style that was put out by the old Politburo they are written as though they're written for children literally, it's so childish that it's short, very short sentences etc of, of what they're doing you know? now he said in, in, in that book he put out after his tour he said uh the system's coming in, he says, we'll need a, a kind of a new religion, he said. It will have to be based on a form of earth worship. 
that's your green, you know, and that's what you say. So they train the children of their nature, the oneness, the singularity, all this kind of rubbish that they've been pushing, uh, uh, and, and that's all connected. But, but again, uh, 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 there's partial truths. When you kill off the planet, we die too, sure. But the thing is, it's for the elite to manage it for themselves and their own profits, etc. Uh, as you accept the proper way to run the world, which they all, they know how to do, uh, and and they of course can incredibly get rich off it too at the same time. Yeah, yeah is uh, anybody who's unfamiliar with the Green Agenda website? There's uh, a number of quotes by Gorbachev on there, uh, and I think that quote you mentioned is is in there about the the new world religion as well. Well, an interesting thing is funny that because as I say, the guy in the states and the family in the states that were to be the head of a lot of this were the Rockefellers. That, that was their appointment. And um, all my Rockefeller said that competition, literally he says, that competition is a sin. The idea was to monopolize everything, you see, and run it properly, as he said, including, including your behavior, including uh, how you'd live, like, right down to the bottom level, uh, from birth to death. It's like Gerfeck in Scotland there, same idea. And, but it, um, yeah, I have something Gorbachev, similar getting introduced here. Yeah, and then Gorbachev... Um, uh, he certainly was uh, you know, all, all the same spiels, but, but old man Rockefeller saw himself as a kind of hidden master. He was into theosophy and all this stuff. You know, uh, you find in these psychopathic types at the top, they look back in their family ancestry, at which has been utterly ruthless. They do eliminate all competition by every possible means. Uh, and then they say, well, for all this wealth, we must be superior to the average man. So he believed in eugenics. Uh, theosophy backed him up on that, the hidden masters as they call themselves. Um, they, they used that to put their, cut their head in quarters in New York. He funded that, that headquarters for theosophy. So they used the New Age movement and all the rest of it to promote all this greening and take over all for their own worth. But you find Gorbachev also, in one of his big interviews that he gave, he had a picture of Christ on his wall and a picture of himself next to it painted to look like Christ. I mean, these guys are megalomaniacs, you know. Yeah. And well, these, are, these are not the top fellows, you know, they're, they're still worker bees. Yeah, well, here's, here's another little quote by Gorbachev uh, uh, under the, the auspices of Green Cross International. Uh, yeah. nature, nature is my God. To me, nature is sacred. Trees are my temples and forests are my cathedrals. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's the old Masonic Grove idea, you know, hmm. that they're prattled on about. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I, I mean, they, they talk about sustainable development and all the rest of it. I've noticed that the latest words, and I heard that again yesterday uh, from from uh, Osborne talking about the budget, and uh, they've all started talking about resilience. Everything seems to be resilient now. Mm -hmm. uh, there's websites up there for resilient children. Uh, we've got the Guardian newspaper has got a, a section called Guardian Cities, and they they go on about uh, resilient cities, and it's uh, the Rockefeller Foundation's 100 Resilient Cities who sponsors the, that section of the Guardian newspaper. Mm -hmm. So, and again, I, I was surprised to hear it in the budget, but it's obviously one of the new buzzwords. Um, so we'll have to watch yeah. out for that and see what they apply that to. It's also the um, they used to call a different name for it too uh, in the states, sustainable cities, and so on. Uh, in different areas, that there were all the greeny cities that had bicycles attached to buses. You put your bus, you could, they had these big racks for bikes, you could attach it to the bus and then take the bus and get back off and get the bike again. Things like that. And uh, these, these are the model cities under the United Nations, but now they're called them Brazilian cities that are all eco friendly and, and full of agencies of spying and all that to make sure you are, etc., etc. We train the public, in other words. Yeah. yeah. We well, were down in London just a bit, and uh, you can see all the Barclays bikes there, which I, th I think uh, I think Boris paid six hundred pound a piece for when they were only uh, one hundred and forty quid or something. Um, and now, uh, just last week, um, I, do, I do a Monday show now and do kind of news articles similar to what you did, but uh, not with as much knowledge, of course. But um, uh, what's his name, Clegg, who who's another um, communist, of course, and uh, his backgrounds in the Soviet Union. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, he, he, was, he came out and said that he wants to see all petrol and diesel cars off the road by 2040. Now, now nobody's elected this guy, even, even no. if the election system worked. He's never been elected anyway. No. Uh, and, and then, of course, the, the day before or the same day, they were pushing the electric car. Mm -hmm. you know, and it's, and these, these things are, are useless. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
But uh, the Guardian as well, I think, put out an article which I read uh, a month or so ago where some of these characters from Top Gear had taken one of these electric cars from uh, Marble Arch in London to Edinburgh and they did it in 12 and a half hours and I thought that's that sounds a bit uh, dodgy. So they said they stopped nine times, uh, you know, a half an hour a time to charge up this thing. Yeah. Um, so you take that off and that leaves seven and a half hours and that's exactly what it said on the, one of the route guides. So you, you think, well, I can't even do that in a petrol car if I'm speeding. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. so that's just the whole thing was garbage. Well, they also had so many of them going fire. They got their nasty for going and fire these. Things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and apart from that, they never tell you how much it costs for that massive rapid charge. It's a fortune it costs you for that. Well, but remember, Agenda Twenty One says that, that, that these private, these little um, public areas where you're all you're all to be crammed in and you live, there's to be no private property. It's rental only. There'll be private landlords, by the way, that own whole chains of cities. Uh, but uh, no, 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 you won't own them yourself. That you rent, and um, there should be no private vehicles, only uh, essential vehicles only. I'm sure your police uh, ambulances and so on, uh, but no private ones. So this is all part of Agenda 21. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, and it's, it's quite easy. You see, they don't forbid you to travel. They simply make it impossible eventually for you to travel, or you can't travel in that old car. It uses gasoline. You know. Uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And the states are adding. They've, they've signed. And so is Britain, by the way. They've, they've signed the, the international treaty to their, their fake front UN again. Um, to add more ethanol to the fuel. That's that's what they call biofuel, but it's ethanol. You know, it's really a wood alcohol. Uh, and they want to go up to 30 percent. Now all the small engines manufacturers are complaining because ethanol ruins the standard gasoline engine. It, it, it just burns your pistons, right? You know, and then a, a month or two. So this is agenda. They won't, they won't forbid you to travel. It's simply make it impossible for you to travel. Well, you can't travel on that thing unless you use ethanol, which if I use ethanol, my car's going to get burned out. Well, we can't help that, sir. You can still travel if you get an electric car, you know. And, and this is the standard technique that we've done through the ages for changing your behavior. Yeah. yeah, well, another another part of that is that they're, they're going after the scrapyards here and shutting yeah. a lot of them down or, or making it impossible for them to operate uh, with the, the legislation and all the rest of it. And, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. At, at the same time, the European Union is coming out and saying that we need to have rules so that uh, you can only put a generic part on your, your car. So if it's a Volvo, you've got to use a Volvo part, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. And I've got a, I've got a 20-year-old uh, Volkswagen Passat, mm -hmm. uh, left-hand left drive. And uh, the exhaust on that is, I think it's got five different parts from five different cars, makes and models and all the rest, all, all welded together and it works. But yeah, uh, yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to get MOT'd here, so I don't. Mm -hmm. It gets MOT'd in a country where it's been welded together. Yeah. And it works perfectly well. So, I mean, when they talk about sustainability and uh, recycling, well, that's that's a perfect example of it. I've got a 20-year car that runs on gas, yeah. not on LPG, and that's not good enough. No, no. Everything that's passed is, is again, again, like like uh, Baruch said, perfectly to say is, is a good reason and is a real reason. Well, we never get the real reasons, you see, until you can think it out yourself. Yeah. That's how it works. Yeah, you mentioned Charles Gordon Darwin earlier. And from his book, The Next Million Years, mm -hmm. uh, 1952, civilization has taught man how to live in dense crowds. And by that very fact, those crowds are likely ultimately ultimately to constitute a majority of the world's population. So that's, that's where we are now. Uh, already there are many who prefer this crowded life, but there are others who do not. And these will gradually be eliminated. Life in the crowded conditions of cities has many unattractive features, but in the long run, these may be overcome. Not so much by altering them, but simply by changing the human race into liking them. So, uh, I mean, we, we could, I mean, Huxley said the same thing. People will yeah. come to enjoy their servitude. And uh, well, that's exactly... You can, you, see, if you do it the Fabian style of training, uh, we adapt and adapt and adapt, and, and eventually adapt right into it without even being conscious that they have until... And until literally you take the, the so-called the primitive man of, of Brave New World, uh, who is a normal man, you know, uh, and, and, get, and put him with the hybrids, uh, they would listen to everything he talked about, about morality and, and, and love, etc. And, and, and these new folk would be polite and listen, but they couldn't fathom how this man was talking about. I mean, they had promiscuity. Uh, London gave, gave birth, a live birth. It was all done genetically and, and test tubes, basically. 
um, you can train the, the people into into accepting anything. I've watched it in my own my own life as they've really radically altered uh, the cultures through the cultural wars. These were wars, you know, cultural wars, all all designed uh, and used uh, and implemented and let go and let loose on the public from the top down, not from the bottom up, and been awfully successful until. If you meet someone today who talks about uh, being celibate, uh, you will think they're nuts. You know? yeah. Yeah, that's how they were for thousands of years until you got married, because the idea of, of being self-sufficient is that the outcome of, uh, of promiscuity is going to be children. Well, who's going to take care of them? Well, you bring in the, the, the government, you bring in the taxation system, you bring in agencies. Until you get this massive welfare system, all, all living awfully well off of you, on top of the agencies, they get incredible paychecks on them, uh, and uh, from the fallout that they create, that was profit of the fallout they create, you know. But um, but mankind at one time, uh, you, you took care of your own and, and you took care of your neighbours, but you, you certainly didn't pay for everybody else's children. You know? Yeah. Well, I, I I did a little job in a a, a crash they call them, and uh, it was a, a paint job, and I was painting all these different rooms, and there was there was children in there, uh, newborn, mm-hmm. basically newborn children, and they they'd been brought into this place in the morning and left there with the the nanny, and it went all through the age groups up to, you know, uh, pre secondary school age, but you had the, the the breakfast club, you had the the afternoon club, and you had all the different age groups all getting there. Uh, taught this stuff from all these people who were into the, the whole green agenda. I, yeah. I don't think any, anybody was employed there that had a different idea in their heads whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And this stuff was just being pumped into these children. They were sat yeah. in front of the television screens watching these videos. Mm-hmm. And uh, upstairs, uh, there was a, a play thing. And this is like a big warehouse, this place. Mm-hmm. And you go upstairs, and the playrooms are cages. Yeah. They throw them in cages with these bouncy mattresses and uh, shut the door. And I just thought, well, there you go. That's yeah. that's it. Train them up to be animals. Too. Bert and Russell was the first one in the 1920s to be allowed to, to try experimental schools for the future. And he was getting a royal charter to, to do this, because what he was doing was illegal, the things that he was pushing and trying on his children. And... Um, uh, and so he, and by the 1930s and 40s, uh, he, he knew how to manipulate the minds of the youth. And he said, he said, we, and he's talking about on behalf of his uh, hereditary lordship, you know, and, and, and all, all the, the, the double class. He said, we used to think that we'd have to take the children away from their parents. Now, this, in order to, 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 so they wouldn't become contaminated with old ideas of independence and families, etc. This is a lord talking on behalf of the British peerage. This is something you expect from the communist side, right? Yeah. And that's how you realize it's all the same. Uh, and he um, says, but now I've, I've found out, you said, that with scientific indoctrination of a child, if we can get them early, at, at the age of two or three, with scientific indoctrination, he says, we can have them for four or five hours a day. And whatever the parents try to communicate of their old values, etc., will be irrelevant. The child will dismiss them because scientific indoctrination is so perfect. So yeah. this, is the, 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 this is his system they're using today. It's all designed, what perhaps today was designed 70 odd years ago or more. Yeah, well I mean this, this Scurfrick thing in Scotland, uh, I, I'm going to become a, a grandparent again in about five months time and it'll be, I've, I've got one granddaughter already but uh, she was born before the Scurfrick thing came in but um, that's I'm, I'm looking at ways where that can be avoided and you can uh, stop this social worker coming into the house because literally, I mean, if, if you if you leave a toy lying about on the floor or you've not emptied your bins or 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 anything, you're, you're, yeah. you're, you're, you've just had a bad day and your house isn't very tidy, um, they're going to be reporting on you and uh, that child will be taken off you. I mean, that's that's the way it's going and it's, it's pretty... Um, Obvious. Uh, again, it's worldwide, because whatever happens in one country is happening globally at the same time. But it's all done through various treaties and organizations of the United Nations. Yeah, I've, I've heard, yeah. Yeah, I heard something, and there was something in the media a couple of weeks ago uh, in regards to England, and, and it was obvious it was going down the same road. But I, I, I don't know if... Uh, I, 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 to be honest, I, I left Scotland in 1999 because I was just sick of the people. I just thought they're mm-hmm. just... They've just given in completely uh, yeah. to, to all this stuff, and I just I couldn't live there anymore. Um, 
and, and maybe that's why they tried it there first. That's maybe that's why they tried the poll tax there first. It's almost a big you know. test case of, of uh, partly uh, despondency. They were trying that for deculturalisation purposes since the Battle of Culloden, basically, uh, when they forbid the Scots even to speak uh, Gaelic or on pain of death. Uh, if you want to destroy a people, you start by destroying their culture. That involves language and everything else, and customs and history. And uh, if you wore tartan, that was a, an instant hanging offence, unless you, your, your clan joined the British army and they brought to fight for the empire. Uh, that lasted for quite a while. And at home, too, they brought in all the teachers from England, who just seen the Ireland, Ireland, too, by the way, uh, and they ruled with an iron fist. And you get to speak the, the, the Queen's English, etc., uh, and so on and so on. And if you spoke your own language, you were punished severely physically, you know, yeah, well. uh, right up until you know, the 50s with the belt, etc. So yeah. that was a complete process of deculturalization of a people who were really a satrapy of London, you know. Uh, their, their history was blotted out. Very old history scholar has. There's nothing like the given uh, in, in the more recent books. And um, and that was blotted out, and were made to feel despondent. Uh, London also uh, decided in the 1960s that uh, Scotland would be turned into a tourist area, and would gradually deindustrialise it before the rest of the country. And so they did. Uh, so despondency, unemployment, uh, no future. And uh, of course, in this, this the late 70s, early 80s, they brought in the drugs, heroin trade, big time. Uh, to destroy what was left as well, and uh, and there you have it. That's how you, this is an ancient technique that's been used before, but uh, it was used on, on Scotland deliberately yeah. as a huge test case for yeah. other countries. I mean, you know, I, I speak to people abroad, and uh, you know, even even people in in England and Ireland, they say, "Oh, Scotland's Scotland's quite a big place," you know. And I go, "Well, yes, yeah, it's, it's fairly big." I say, "But there's only five million people there." And uh, they go, "How many?" And I go, "Yeah, you got uh, you got Aberdeen, uh, Inverness, Dundee, Edinburgh, Glasgow." And, and that's it, you know. That's it. The rest of it's empty. Well, um, I see people that meet in the highlands and the, the, the tourists, and they'd say, "Oh, gee, this is really beautiful. Look all this space and hills." But I says, "Yeah." I says, "It's uh, makes me think that millions of folk used to live here, and they didn't know." I says, "Yeah, they cleared these highlands." I says, uh, "You read John Preble, the line in the north, you know, the highland clearances and all the books he put out." Uh, from from uh, sources from from uh, original history historical sources from London that they kept secret there for a long time, <clears throat> and and they, they talked about the hundreds and hundreds of boats that came uh, year after year as they were shoving along these boats and, and clearing them off uh, into the colonies as they called them, and many of them were so bad by these these rogue merchants that they put their old ships out there they could see them sinking off the coast with all their families on it. Uh, lots of them died that way. It was took up no idea of the, 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 the cultural genocide. But uh, and by the way, under under the the Treaty of the United Nations, even destroying our cultures is included in genocide. By the way, they were linked to physical destruction as well. So London had to do that. And then when you read the, the books of uh, the economist John Stuart Mill and his son as well, the same name, and couple that with the H. G. Wells one as well, they both had the Scots and the Irish down for liquidation because they kept rebelling. They would adapt to something. Yeah, I mean, there was, there was, uh, there were many, many millions more in Ireland then as well as, as than there are yeah. now, and uh, the, the, but I mean, I I've spent what twelve years in Ireland, and at least they've still got a bit of fight, but uh, they're, they're certainly um, going after them and trying to take it out of them, um, yeah. that, mainly through economics, as to be said at the moment, and uh, but also also um, and we'll, we'll get onto this in the sec well, in the second hour, but we'll get onto this next because it's part of the same thing, the entertainment industry, and. Uh, they're really, uh, they built up the rugby team and that, that's and their football team and that's that's the whole focus of the, the attention. They've, they've gone away from the Gaelic games kind of thing, the traditional uh, games that used to play in the villages and stuff, and it's all now become this um, multinational corporate um, thing. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll we'll come back and talk about the the media, the entertainment industry, and uh, and yeah, the sports, the the Coliseum, and all that stuff that uh, Wells talked about as well. Yeah. After the next piece of music. Welcome back to the second hour of Reality Bites Radio uh, on the 20th of March 2014 with our guest Alan Watt of CuttingThroughTheMatrix.com and Alan, you've got you've got other sites as well if you want to just um, throw them out there while we're, we're talking yeah, about that. I've got, uh, if you go to uh, CuttingThroughTheMatrix.com you'll see all the other sites listed but I also have, for Europe, I've got also uh, 
Alan Watt Sentient, sentinel.com, uh, so sorry, dot, um, EU, it is, EU. Yep. So it's Alan Watt Sentient, sentinel.eu, and uh, they can get there. Not only that, uh, they have all the shows on it. Not all the shows, there are a lot of shows to put on there, but uh, they also have transcripts of many of the shows I've done too, for if you want to read them. So there's a lot of information there. It's all free too. You know. Yep. Okay, we were, we were talking off air and we kind of touched on it before we went to the break. Uh, the entertainment industry, uh, the media, uh, of course, sport comes into the entertainment. Um, I, I mean, you could talk about this for hours, as, as with Agenda 21, but, uh, well, you you were in that uh, industry, so that's possibly your experience is, is where we start. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the thing is, it's nothing like you're taught by television or the British Idol or American Idol, etc., it's rigged. It's very rigged. Everything's rigged. Uh, it's a complete uh, system. It's a complete system where everyone must know everybody else in the system who run you at the bottom if you go in as a musician. And uh, it's a very old system, by the way, long before records came in. Uh, this is a clique running the culture industry. Um, uh, you, you'll find that... Uh, uh, go back to the days of Plato, they knew how important it was to, to give plays out, certain kinds of plays, the proper kind of plays, as I say, uh, on behalf of the establishment, and, and the proper kind of music. So, so much so that Plato wanted musicians to be licensed back then because he said that uh, rhyme, it put to revolution, with and music could really incite the youth to riot. Uh, so they knew back then the power of the arts, as they called it. Uh, and it was so powerful, too, that the establishment in Athens and other places, too, the old Grecian Empire, had made it mandatory that everyone, even the slaves, had to turn up when big drama teams would come through or acting teams would come through on their tours uh, in ancient times and had to watch it because we get their updates like we get our updates today on what's PC and what the establishment wants. And it all came from the top down. Well, it's never changed. Any ruling establishment always gives you uh, what you're supposed to believe uh, and it's repetition too after that uh, and they, have, they will not tolerate any dissension from, from the status quo and, and then from the uh, this is it type of thing so uh, I think Adam Curtis did an awfully good uh, presentation on some of the stuff using the footage from the BBC uh, old footage uh, on, on the culture part of the culture industry of Britain uh, how it changed during the, the 60s, the 50s and the 60s, uh, and how it showed you some of the old clips of the old TV shows they used to show, Dixon and Doc Green, things like that, the, the policeman is your friend and a neighborhood type of thing, all to, 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 to make you think that's how it really was, we're all wonderful people. Um, and then anyway, it showed you the radical change from the 60s when they started showing you other parts of the system that you never really noticed before you took for granted. And you couple, you couple that with Jacques Elol, who the philosopher who in France who said that uh, all all um, drama to do with government law and law and all of its arms, including the court systems and the police, um, any dramas to do with hospitals, for instance, professions, etc., uh, these are all propaganda spiels. Doesn't matter. They give you a good hook to get you in a mystery or something to make you watch it to the end. Uh, but you're getting downloaded with propaganda until you think they're all so perfect and so caring and they're there for us, that's why they exist. But nothing is further from the truth, you see. So uh, uh, it's the same with today with the delivery of pornography. You can't watch anything with, without some kind of porn being in it, uh, especially for the youth. All the horror movies are simply uh, called tits and bums movies because that's what they are. Uh, and that's when their hormones are raging. And they, 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 they have a storyline there, a very thin storyline always, with lots of screaming and chasing and terror. And then, but they always have sex in there because that's the message. That's, that's, so the story uh, is simply, the story is a delivery mechanism for the porn. That's what it is. People don't need to rehydrate it themselves. Uh, you'll find it too, uh, getting shoved into the adult populations, because H.T. Wells wanted to abolish marriage altogether, as many of them did in fact. And uh, the state would eventually authorize who should have a child and by whom, and they wouldn't necessarily live together. That was the old agenda, which has come true for most folk. Uh, the state would rear them or be uh, co-partners with them in the weaning of the children. So everything's been accomplished through 
the gradual ab abolition of the culture through uh, uh, people adapting into the new system that was delivered to them by primarily fiction, you see. It's the greatest tool ever, ever designed, is fiction. You can get new messages across. Uh, children especially will mimic that they're born miniatures, whatever they see. Uh, that's why even their language is fantastic. Children can learn five languages if they're trotting around the world before they're ten. And they pick them up so fast because they're mimickers. Uh, they lose it eventually as they go on. So if you can get them very young and start to, as Bertrand Russell was taught, to, was doing in his uh, experimental schools in the 20s and 30s, he said if we can get the children uh, hypersexualized before puberty uh, until they're obsessed with it, he says they'll never stick with a partner long enough to have a child, never get mine, get married. You see, so it, it, the culture industry is one of the main parts of directing the future in the Fabian style. We are, we are short-term thinkers as human beings. Uh, uh, we plan short term, men especially, more than women. Uh, we want to go and build something and do it and get it done and that's it. Uh, the big boys know that using the Fabian style through maybe a period of 70 years, you've got three generations going up, about 20 years old, having a child, uh, 20 years old, having a child. So uh, you, simply, uh, you simply push the envelope with each generation until your granny can sit with her daughter and, and her daughter and, and, and watch the envelope for porn on TV getting pushed until eventually you'll have live sex, even in comedy shows. I said that many years ago. Well, uh, that's the stage where they want to bring it down. And the big thing that uh, uh, that uh, Aldous Huxley's brother, Julian Huxley, in Esco said in his famous speech there, he was a, a co-founder of Planned Parenthood. He wanted to uh, kill most of the children, actually, the working classes. He won't need them in the future because we won't have all these jobs for them. He, uh, he said that, uh, along with Margaret Sanger, the children are weeds, basically, for the working classes. But uh, he also uh, gave the agenda there uh, for, for, for the future by using the culture industry, etc., to train the general public not to have children, hypersexualize them, uh, dehumanize them to an extent, too, he says, until we knock them off their pedestal, thinking they're the supreme being on the planet until they realize they're only another animal. When they, when they believe they're only another animal, they'll accept the, the, the indoctrination and, and the, the orders coming from experts who will be running them. Well, that's where we are today. Yeah, I, I, saw, I saw a headline in one of the, the rags uh, during the week, and it was, um, you know, Kate and Will uh, holding the baby, and the, the big headline above it was, One's Enough. And yeah. uh, yes, oh well, there you go. But uh, you're yeah. talking about the, the the pornography. And on Monday, I read out uh, two articles actually um, contrasting. One one was in one of the the broadsheets talking about how they were going to teach pornography in school. And uh, you know they had to you know, some some porn was okay. Some of it was good. Some of it was bad. You know it was, it was neither here nor there. It was all moral relativity and all that stuff. And then there was another one in the Guardian, of course, um, which boasts of uh, having Charlie Skelton. Uh, who supposedly protests against Bilderberg, and his colleague Victoria Corrin, who went over to Amsterdam and produced a hardcore pornography movie and wrote a book about it, and very proud of the fact. Um, but that's The Guardian, and they, they were doing a, an ad, really, as, as you've mentioned many times before, that most of these stuff that's put in the papers are, are ads. And it was, a, it was an application for your mobile phone to teach you how to perform moral sex on a woman. Yeah. And, it, and it had people licking the phone and all this stuff. And mm -hmm. I, I kind of I set up this... Um, this new Monday thing, just to read through the articles, and I, I don't, I don't really uh, read over them before I go to air because I, I want to be as shocked myself mm -hmm. as as the audience are. And I got halfway through that, and I, I just thought, oh, God, I should have read this, but um, mm -hmm. it was, it's disgusting, and it's, yeah. it's in the mainstream media. In the mainstream, but it all comes from the mainstream. Um, I can remember when they brought out copy of the pops. It was the Bible was small than it was out actually, but. Uh, that, was, that was Jimmy Savile, of course, and the pants people on there that were the go-go dancers that uh, wore hardly anything at all, etc. But uh, that was all pushed by the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation. It's a crown corporation owned by the government, you know. So here's the elite once again. And by the way, but at that time, every employee of the BBC had to have gone to Eton. You couldn't get in unless you were from Eton. So here's the British establishment, the, the wealthy, making sure that the elite were going to be, I mean, the ordinary folk were going to be degenerate by copying all the stuff that they were getting uh, put in their face, etc. At the same time, they were throwing out LSD, etc., etc. You know? 
and, and I mean throwing it out, they were coming out with them and tossing bags of it over the university walls. You know. So uh, this was a big push on behalf of those who already ruled by commerce through monopolization, etc., and the British Empire. Uh, to, to alter the culture to the next step for total con control of the public, uh, and well, look at it today, it's, it's dysfunctional. Yeah, yeah. Well, dysfunctional. Yeah, and what, what I've noticed now in the uh, well, particularly the American media, they ha they have these series now. They have season one, season two, season two. It just goes on and on and on and on. Uh, one of them is uh, The Walking Dead. It's all about zombies uh -huh. um, who who apparently got a virus and they're, they're going around eating people. Uh, but from what I gather, the zombies are actually us, and uh, yeah. the people killing them are the the ones that should uh, go on and survive and all that stuff. Um, and, and they've got they've got people in there um, murdering children and all sorts of things going on. Uh, there's another one um, which is called uh, Fallen Skies, and it's about an, an alien invasion. But um, I've I've, I've kind of plowing my way through these things to see where it's going, and it looks like um, these things are going to have been genetically modified and. Uh, they're all set up by the elite in the first place. Uh, and the other one is revolution, where all the power goes out, and it's caused by nanotechnology and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're being primed for it, uh, and it's 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 worse than dystopian. It's it's just pure uh, anarchy and uh, death and destruction and utter you know, horrendous violence. Um, yeah. And it's moved. It, it's interesting. It's moved from uh, they're all fighting the same enemy, whether it be the aliens or or the really bad, bad people, uh, just down to killing each other, willy-nilly. Well, yeah, <laughs> uh, since, since the 80s, they've been churning out these disaster movies of the end times, the end of the world, etc. And it's always folk, uh, there's always a dumb elite with the, the, the uniform guards managing on behalf of the world corporation and the rest of the public living in rubble, etc., uh, that's a story they've been pushing over and over again. And I kept wondering after that uh, article that came out, that popped up in my website, it's in the archive section on the, from the Department of Defence for Britain, the think tank, when they put the 90 odd page report on uh, the future. Uh, so have the preparations for the military for the future, future conflicts and so on. And, and they said in it that uh, they wanted to uh, eventually have super cities. Uh, across the world, to be the end of nations, they'll all, all, all be owned by corporations, basically. And uh, what they didn't mention was all the people, what happened to all the people that didn't get into those cities across the world, that are abolishing nations and all. Well, they'll have to be killed off one way or another, you see. And that's what they're really hinting about in, in their articles when you read it very carefully. They have to eliminate all the rioters and flash mobs and blah, blah, blah that will be out there who are unhappy with it all. I mean, these are the scenarios they play out uh, in, in their big, big think tanks all the time, all the time, on how to deal with the, the general public and still achieve their objectives, for the, always to the future, for their own survival of this elite and the system that, that uh, is employed to take care of them. So they're way ahead of it all. And that's where you're zombie, a zombie, remember, is someone that used to be alive, meaning intelligent and bright. That's what it means. Uh, and and he's, he's poisoned. Never forget that a, a zombie is poisoned and then brought back from the dead as a slave. Uh, that's the traditional meaning of a, of a zombie. And the person who poisoned them and brings them back, revives them, is now the master. So they give me all these little subliminal things and not mocking us at the same time. They always mock the victim. You know, always. They can't help but actually enjoy it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the uh, I, I don't watch television as as such. I, I see bits and pieces online and stuff, like and you know, I, I watch these things just to see what what they're trying to push out there. But uh, I mean, the, the sport. If we, if we take the sport, we talked all fair about it. Uh, it's we just had the the Olympics, which. You know, incidentally, there wasn't that much coverage over here about uh, because it was in Russia, I guess. But uh, mm -hmm. the sorry, the Winter Olympics, uh, but the Summer Olympics, Olympics, of course, were were all over the place uh, because they were in London. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, it's it we're we're nearly at the stage where we're looking at one of these old movies with the gladiators and and stuff like this, and uh, everybody's hyped up to be the, the supreme being, as it were, of their of their. Um, the specified uh, specialist kind of bit in the in the in the pantomime, as it were, and 
the the coverage in the press over here is, is sickening. I mean, somebody's um, you know knocked a, a piece of plastic over a net a few times and and won a bronze medal, and all of a sudden they're all over the television and on the yeah. news on Newsnight, and uh, they're the best things to slice bread. But nobody heard of them three weeks mm-hmm. before that. And uh, we're all supposed to look up to these people, and and you know that's 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 the pinnacle of our achievement is to is to do this. Don't 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 think about being an engineer or. No. Or you know, or inventing anything, or or going out and then um, you know helping people who need it, and and being mm-hmm. being a a good human being, if you, if you like. Uh, no, no, no. Just just distract, just distract yourself. Go and do something um, useless. And, and the same goes in with the the university courses. I mean, the, yeah. there's so many university courses here, which um, I I don't know. I, if I if I go back 25 years, children could have done them. Yes, I know. I know. You know. I mean, it's utterly ridiculous. It's all political correctness as well. You know, it's just that, <laughs> yeah, know. yeah. But, but that's what we've got. I mean, flash in the pan careers uh, uh, again has given you this ridiculous. You see, you don't study and work towards something. Just have a, just do a childish game like run a race. I mean, you see, you give up those things when you leave school, when you're at primary school. You know, uh, that's when you run races and stuff, or run about with balls in a game. Um, but, but again, you have massive uh, people, well, wealthy folk, owning all these big football teams in the States and, and soccer teams in Britain. Uh, it's a great uh, corporate welfare system, too, you'll find, because there, there are big arenas, sports arenas, are generally paid for by the public, just through your tax money, given to them for free, you know. And they have all these tax deals, too, because uh, oh, they're helping the city, et cetera, et cetera, by attracting tourists, blah, blah, to watch the sports. Well, once their tax deal is up after 15 years or whatever, they move off to some other place. I mean, it's the same with big corporations of any kind. Everything's a scam. And uh, and to be honest with you, I mean, uh, as a pinnacle of success, a guy who's running about with a ball on a field and getting millions of bucks for doing it, I mean, is that, is that the whole point of similar? No, it's not. You know, it's, it's nonsense. Uh, they're actually I mean, keeping you as a child in a sense. But as I said, when you give it up, it's, it's just like the old uh, Paul in the New Testament said, I think it was, uh, when I was a child, I thought of it as a child, and I did as a child, but now I'm a man, and I put all childish things behind me. Uh, so why have they revived all this nonsense? But again, uh, because most folk today are powerless, uh, men especially, actually, since all their indoctrination, since the 60s, and felt to feel the whole guilt to the world for things they didn't do. But... Uh, you'll find that they're so powerless they either go crazy behind the driving or the wheel of the car there's no time they feel powers on the road or else as they, they live through uh, vicariously someone running about with a ball and they feel like a warrior uh, that's what they've got because they're technically powerless in their own life that's a fact yeah, just uh, talk, talking about how childish it gets. Uh, I, I was at, down in Parliament yesterday, and uh, I wanted to get a, a photograph over the top of the, the the crowd, and I couldn't see because the police officers were there. Mm-hmm. So I, I had the back to me, so I didn't want to jump up on the wall when they had the back to me in case they, they got the wrong idea. So I tapped one of them on the shoulder, and he turned around and I said, "Do you mind if I get up on the wall here? I just want to take a photograph." And he says, "Yeah, yeah, fine." He says, "Have you done a health and safety assessment?" And, and the wall was two feet high. Yeah. I, I said, uh, no, I'm an adult. Mm-hmm. And he just looked at me as if I had two heads. I just, yeah. I, I, and he was dead serious. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just yeah. unbelievable. Well, yeah, you're living in the time of control freaks and, uh, and authoritarianism where you can't do anything of your own free will. Uh, you have to get an expert to tell you it's okay or it's not. Yeah. It's all been achieved. Well, well definitely. Definitely. Um, I mean, there, there are a few people out there. Uh, trying to fight back but uh, not enough yeah. at the moment unfortunately not enough um, we'll go to another piece of music and then we'll, we'll hit the last what 25 minutes or so and uh, yeah take it away Steve ok we're into the last 20 uh, odd minutes or so with Alan Watts on Reality Bites Radio uh, we've done uh, Agenda 21 we've done a, a bit of the, the media the entertainment industry well let's let's talk about the media Alan um, uh, we, we mentioned, you mentioned earlier that uh there was no uh, law anywhere in the world that the media had to tell you the truth. Right. And I, I mentioned earlier, I can't remember if it was on air or not, that uh, yesterday uh, was the most blatant example of uh, the control of the media and all going through the, well, I did mention on air, uh, going through the BBC. I mean, they had this uh, 
big platform. They were the only ones raised off the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, they were about eight, ten feet with this big platform with the, the, the roof on it, the canopy and everything on it. All the big lights up there. And that's where all the politicians went up to sit and get their yeah. interviews. And all the feeds from there, all the cables out there went to all the other ones. And all the, all the other media were just sitting there doing absolutely nothing and yeah. just taking this information and churning out. And we had um, CNBC, the, the business channel, uh, and they were quite close to the, the perimeter. And uh, Norman Lamont was being interviewed by them at one point. And I think actually somebody from the Scottish National Party was there as well. But Norman Lamont was there, and I don't know if you've heard of Bill Maloney. Uh, over no. here, does uh, pie and mash films. He's done a lot of films on the uh, paedophile rings and stuff uh, in Britain, Elm House and uh, other uh, homes and churches and stuff that have been abusing children over over decades. And uh, he was he was shouting over to me, "Why don't you come and talk to me?" You know. And she was going, "Oh, you're disturbing our interview, all this kind of stuff." And I said, "Well, what are you talking about? You're talking about the price the price of cheese or something?" You know, mm -hmm. people get abused and. and uh, the, the police came up to me because we'd done a little interview with them uh, over the, the cordon uh, to camera and, it, and the liaison guy came up to me and says, uh, do you mind having a word with your friend and get him to come down here? And I said, uh, no, I've done an interview with him already, thanks. Mm -hmm. And he says, but you know him, he's, he's, he's disrupting that interview over there. I said, it's not my problem, mate. Yeah. You know, and, and they, they just they did not want anybody whatsoever uh, talking out of turn on, on anybody's uh, audio or whatever, and we were fortunate enough to be in there. Or for, I say, for, I say fortunate, but uh, we were in there, and uh, deliberately so, not being provocative. Because uh, there's a sign in there. Uh, I can't remember the name of the street. Um, the name of the street that's on anyway, and it's that specific area, College Green. It's part of the parliamentary estate, which means the people own it, um, but they can throw you off at any time for whatever reason they want. Mm -hmm. And you think, well, where's your freedom of speech when you can't actually go onto a piece of your own property and, and voice your opinion uh, to the media? Mm -hmm. But uh, we weren't allowed to approach any of the, the media there because uh, we, we wanted to ask them what, what they thought they were reporting. Yeah. You know, but they, they wouldn't talk to us. And one of them, uh, I think the girl could only have been about 18, 19 years old. And she was, she was doing an interview of uh, like the likes of Norman Lamont and people like that. And uh, she said, oh, I, I can't talk to you guys because uh, my editor would sack me. Hmm. Yeah. I said, well, I said, why are you in this career then? Because you ain't going to, you know, what, what, what pride do you get? What satisfaction is there in this? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I don't know what to teach them at college, but uh, yeah, maybe you know. <laughs> I don't know. Well, well it's also self-interest. I mean, they've created, a, as Russell said, too, we'll create a hedonistic, narcissistic society. And more so with those who are or consider themselves middle class, uh, and they therefore they're quite willing to go along for their paychecks to do anything because they've been that they don't care about other people really, and uh, they're on the winning side they think you see, and so they're willing to go along with it. Uh, that's part of the problem today. They have no empathy for others outside themselves or their own clique. Uh, so self-interest where it rules it wins out for these kind of people. And they don't really care what's happening outside themselves. Yeah, yeah. And another thing here's the uh, was it I've mentioned it before on there the uh, behavioural insights team, uh, the government department that's set into behavioural change and all the rest of it. And you go there, and the the last thing they put up was uh, organ donor organ donation, mm -hmm. and that's that's been pushed in the the BBC and all that now as well. Uh, oh, you're selfish if you don't uh, get yourself a donor yeah. card, all yeah. this, and uh, it's the 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 way they they word the questions, uh, it's it's all it's all led in the direction they want, and they'll come up with statements which really don't have a right answer. Sure. That is to leave you in this kind of limbo where you think, oh well, maybe that's okay, maybe it's not, but uh, you know, I'm sure somebody will, will get some benefit out of it, so it doesn't bother me, that kind of thing, and they just let it go, and uh, and you can almost hear the the presenters smirking in the background saying, gotcha, you know. Yeah. Well, Monty Python had that in, in the, the, the movie, the uh, it was it, the meaning of life. It starts off with the with the two couple, the two guys who turn up at a doorstep asking for the husband's liver, you know. Yeah. And uh, it's a comedy, of course, but uh, they, these guys knew the agenda. They knew this whole agenda. But people ever ask why? Why today is there such a massive need for organs? Uh, it's a worldwide network, you know, the, the organ donation business, big big business too, and. Uh, 
I know a surgeon who he, he calls himself a harvester. He, he goes out and takes hearts and lungs of people. They've come up with a new technique today where they can actually uh, keep them uh, keep the stuff fresh for much longer than used to, so they can transport it across the world. Massive market. So you think it's going to to someone in, in your own country, hopefully someone you know or or someone local, but no, it's going to we're going to China for all you know for some big league there, but. Uh, uh, I can remember, I think it was in the 90s, a big scandal came out in Britain because they, they, it started off in Halifax, Nova Scotia, apparently. There was a whole warehouse found of body parts. They came from the Midlands, I think, in England. And the investigation dragged on for a while. Little bits came out at a time. Apparently, parents had been told over a 10 or 15 year period that their children had died in the hospital in this big National Health Service region uh, had been given what they thought were the corpses of their children uh, and, and had them buried at the funeral. And then uh, uh, three or four times they had to redo it as they added more organs that they found stashed away in, in uh, with literally warehouses in England, England and then eventually in Nova Scotia. It was never explained completely as to why this was happening. But the guy who was in charge of the National Health Service for that whole, I think it was in Manchester, it was in Manchester or something, he um, apparently had ultimate authority to do all this from the, from the top of the government. He was never charged for anything. Uh, it was never disclosed to the public as to why there was this ongoing collection of, of body tissues, body parts from thousands and thousands of children had even taken place. And were they experimenting on it? What were they doing? Uh, we... We are living at a bottom level in a reality that's obsolete in the past somewhere, uh, but it's not in the present, um, because what they're up to today, from the spraying of the skies to, to the electromagnetic fields that they're using and HARP uh, and the Wi-Fi and all the rest of it uh, and everything else, we don't even know what reality is. We, we're reduced to what it says and the daily record or the daily mail or, or, or stuff like that. that. That's how bad it is as far as reality is for us. So different, it's the bottom rung of the ladder that we're, the general population are on at any one time. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the news, well, I'll call them newspapers, but uh, the, the, the papers over here, um, you, I'll, I'll, I go into the paper shop and I'll, I'll leaf through them and, and just, it's, it's just bewildering that people actually read that stuff and, uh, and take it in and think, well, okay, oh, well, they're talking about it in the shop, going, oh, that's terrible, that's terrible, or, or whatever it is. Oh, look at, look at so and so. She's had her breasts removed, apparently. Um, you know, that kind of thing. And that's yeah. that's the, the that's the conversation for the day. It's a conversation on the bus and the work. And, and uh, it's, I mean, people people used to actually talk about real issues, uh, what was going on in their in their, their own community, and uh, what what happened to Mrs. Smith last week because she broke her leg, and we're going around to help her tomorrow, and, and all that kind of stuff. And it, there's none of it anymore. There, there, we we hear all this. Um, oh yeah, we're looking after your community. Well, there is no community anymore. No, it's, it's gone. And I think that, when I was when I was small, um, in a sense, everybody around you in your street was your mum. Every, every woman was your mum. Because if you did anything wrong, they could run out and stick in the head, and that was it. You know? And uh, and get off with it. And, and so everybody, you know, everybody watched out for everybody else. That was the natural way of it. And uh, you didn't have all the cops. You didn't need the cops, in fact, because everybody watched out for everybody else and helped everybody else out too. Uh, people who had cancers, I remember uh, your, your folks would take turns in the streets uh, cooking their dinners for them and taking them over and things like that. It, that. These were the real communities where folk knew who everybody was, they were concerned about everybody else. Um, if your mum was in the hospital, uh, one of the neighbours would, would, would feed the children uh, while well, the mother was in the hospital. Like, you had no problems. About, you didn't need government agencies for all these things you have today. Because government agencies, remember, it's not just a two-edged sword. The reason they come out in the first place is the fake reason. The real reason is to gain more authority over you. So yeah. uh, the real communities are pretty well gone. I can remember, too, when, when folk would get laid off uh, and folk would have collections and they would pay off the rent for the folk who couldn't afford it and stuff. I mean, this all came from the people themselves. Because uh, one day it might be your turn to get help. And that's how it worked quite naturally. And that had been that way for a long, long time. It's all gone now. 
Yeah, yeah. I, remember, it's, I mean, we've kind of gone full circle, really, because I was, uh, when you were talking about the people helping each other out, uh, down in Somerset now, that, that's actually what's happening. Uh, and they, because they had to, they, they had to set up uh, a big food store somewhere that people could get access to. Uh, I, I don't mean a shop. I mean, people just brought loads of food from all over. I mean, from up in Scotland and stuff, people were driving down with truckloads of food and, and leaving it yeah. for people. And uh, that, that sense of community has actually returned there because through through necessity. And mm-hmm. they're now, they're now realising that the state has basically abandoned them. Mm-hmm. And, and they're starting to kind of look outside the box, as it were, and say, yeah, well, well we can do this ourselves. We don't need these agencies to, right. to help us out. And, and all uh, you can do now is abolish the, all the taxes that aren't coming down either for all these supposed services that don't exist. Yeah. Well, ex- exactly, yeah. I mean, I, I, I sent an FOI to my council, and I said to them, uh, excuse me, is, is this uh, council tax or is it council's tax? I just said, excuse me? I said, is it council tax or council's tax in the plural? In the plural? Mm-hmm. And she says, what do you mean? I says, well, I've got three councils on my bill. I thought yeah. I only had one. And I says, what does is, what is this one do? And she says, oh, well, they, they do the roads. I says, well, what does road tax pay for then? Mm-hmm. And, I, and she couldn't answer. I'll get somebody to call you back on that. I says, oh, don't bother. I says, well, what does this one do? She says, oh, they do the bins and stuff like that. I says, well, I, that, that's tangible. I can see that. I can see somebody's doing something. Uh, I says, what does the parish council do? She says, oh, they look after the, the public toilets in the village and uh, some of the green areas. I say, well, they don't look after mine and I don't use the toilets. So why am I paying for that? You know, so why can't the, why can't the church pay for that? I mean, yeah. you know, what's what's that got to do with me? Uh, but uh, I, I did want one of the major councils to write back and say we uh, we funded uh, the Gay Pride March last week and say you know and write back to them and say well actually I'm not, I'm never going to benefit from that mm-hmm. and see what they said to that one because yeah. because uh, then I'm being discriminated against because I'm heterosexual. Yeah, of course, but again, <laughs> going back to even Lenin and Lenin was put in maybe came from Switzerland initially, but. And he wasn't Swiss either, but um, uh, Lenin uh, said that uh, the West will should create, gradually create uh, agencies, government agencies or services, he called them. He said they'll all be, he said they'll, they'll, they'll explode over the West over many years, in a generation or two or three generations. He said they will become authorities over the people, that's their function. Yeah, well, I think exactly that, what for. Yeah, yeah I, th- I think the, the, the one you mentioned earlier and possibly the the most sinister today is this Gurfrek thing, because that's that's going to affect everything. Uh, well, the, the the point is is to uh, is, is to literally examine every child born frequently, even monthly, uh, for for up for seeing if it's politically correct. Any if that child, especially the males, show any inclination for too much inquisitiveness. Uh, they'll be going in for uh, rectification, you might say, to get them back on the on the the, the authorised path uh, of not asking certain questions, etc. So curiosity could be a dangerous thing today, you know. But it's you know, a terrible business thing to say, but it's so true. Curiosity is forbidden in certain areas, and and um, and that these these agents are, are going to do psychological testing on them constantly. They want to see how they feel about against sexual issues, and and also uh, even before they're five, they want to find out how they view other peoples, and neighbours, and, and different ethnic communities, and so on and so on. Now a child is curious, uh, is going to have his opinions, and uh, if that child's opinions, even your opinions can change as you're learning naturally, you know. Uh, and but that's not going to work that way. It's going to be, oh, this child asked this particular question today, or he's made this little comment. Um, uh, so you're going for rectification, just like they've drugged them in the schools if they show too much inquisitiveness. They're going to rectify those children. This is a total social engineering of a society, yeah, from 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 birth, literally, from literally from birth. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, well, it certainly is from birth in Scotland. I think there'll be a, they'll probably be at the hospital bed uh, when when the baby's born. Who knows? Yeah. But uh, you know, curiosity killed the cat. Well, they've they moved up from cats. They're going to bump you off as well. Um, the, and, and there was a thing came out uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, they, they first uh, started touting this three parent uh, thing. They were going to they mix the genes from three different parents. And mm-hmm. now they're now they're talking about multiple parents. So that the child isn't even going to have uh, uh, two parents. At all, they've got nobody to relate to. They've not got a mother or father. They've just got this uh, group of people who, who are supposedly uh, their parents. Here's how you, what you have to understand: uh, when these boys make a war on something, 
it, there's more involved in what you think initially. Uh, when you had a, the, when the communists and the, the, the capitalists of the West said that about war to destroy the family unit, uh, there was more than just that. They both believed that eventually science was to control everything on behalf of the, the wild men, as Charles Galton Darwin called his own upper class, you know, who could make decisions, not who wouldn't be indoctrinated. Um, and, and so the destruction of the family unit, it was only one part of one stage on the way to their goals. Uh, homosexual liberation is a, a stage on the way to it. So is the lesbian movement and so on, the transgender movement, until all normalcy of the way tradition, the way it was, is destroyed. And then when, when everything's in flux, you can bring in the multi-parent family, and then eventually you won't even know even where the donors came from for different genes. This is all a staged plan, you see, step by step. But first you've got to destroy all what was traditional and normal to bring it all in, and then hit them with all kinds of things that you think are unrelated, get you even fighting about it and arguing about it. They don't care about homosexuals or lesbians at the top. They don't give a darn because they, they've done all. They've never followed any traditional sexual morality at the elite done through centuries, thousands of years, you know, for themselves. Never, ever. And um, the only important things that they have to do is to at least, at least to have offspring. They don't care who from, uh, except it's from one of their own elite. Uh, and they don't just even stay with them or live with them. And that keeps their, their progeny going. But um, uh, you must destroy tradition to bring in the new, but once you're in flux, getting hit with so many things that you think are just silly, um, then it's to get to the real goal, which is to, well, anything's normal, here's the new uh, human engineered hybrid creation, etc., or, or the part cyborg even, uh, or even a brand new being. Uh, I've got an old science book here where they talked about doing this very agenda, by the way. Um, by scientists, by scientists, and they said that eventually, if really undersea get divers, we use them now to, to repair the oil rigs in the North Sea. Uh, the guys who can weld underwater, it says, but we could do the same thing by getting, creating gills in a human being. So all these things have to be done. At least when they brought in a half fish man, we see that's inhumane, blah blah blah. But you simply give a whole generation, hit them with all traditional destruction until anything goes, lots of science fiction, and then you bring out your fish man, nobody, nobody's going to care. Yep. We've only got um, five minutes left. Uh, give us a, a, a brief outline of what you're doing now. I, I know you were uh, writing another book, or two books, mm -hmm. three books, I don't know. Yep. And, do you want to uh, give them a plug? Yeah, they, they haven't just quite finished yet, because I've got, I've got to get them uh, all printed up. But... Uh, uh, I've gone into some things more deeper too. I've done put more poetry out there as well, and um, and what I've been doing this winter, apart from trying to get everything done, uh, you would believe that if I hadn't taken this winter off, I would never have survived because every day has been shoveling, shoveling snow. I mean, lots of snow. And my driveway isn't from the pavement sort of thing to the to the door. It's like, it's like hundreds of feet, a few hundred feet <laughs> to get out of here. So I've been getting about a foot of snow a day, sometimes more. Uh, sometimes day and night, so it's like two feet at times. I've never seen so much. If I'd been trying to do a show at the same time, I'd have been burned right out, you know. So I've been getting the books finished and, and up to date, uh, looking, standing back and looking at the whole system of what people think is the is the uh, opposition to everything that's going to see, because I know there's a lot of, there's a lot of things out there that aren't quite as the same. I'm well aware of it all, actually. And I know, again, too, that the ones that they are genuine are fighting this. Um, I know how they're destroyed or taken over and, and, and are misled, even, you know. So the boys at the top, never forget, are not stupid. I mean, you have, when, when we at the bottom, as I say, we're at the bottom rung of reality. The guys at the top in the big think tanks are employed full time on specific problems for each think tank to deal with just specific areas of the agenda. We at the bottom have got to try and find all of this stuff, which is almost impossible, keep track of it all, and find out what's important enough to put a, a, a story on it and what's going on. Um, that's one heck of a task. Um, I, so I realized that the, the main thing is to come back to the basics of it all, come back to the history of it all, and, and keep to reality of it all, too. Um, and say, here's all your documentation on it. 
uh, he's the big players who helped develop the present culture we're living through today. Many of them are dead now, long dead. But the, all, the, all the changes we're going through right now were designed back in the 50s by guys now dead who worked in the big cultural industry think tanks. So we're living through a script, and it's time we stop the script because at the end, um, it's, it's not for our benefit. People also have to decide basic things like, what is freedom? If you get 100 people together today, you'll get 100 different answers. There's so much confusion out there. What literally is freedom? Uh, what do they want out of this system? What do they want? These things are never answered uh, as good as uh, uh, pointing to all the stories we're given to, 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 to prattle on about and argue about. Like, what's the solution to this? Is there a solution to this? You have to get common agreements because organization is the only way it's going to, you're, going to, you're going to fight this and overcome it. Yeah. And in the organization, you're guaranteed to have infiltration. Guaranteed to have infiltration. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> you almost have to have a mandate, and, and here's your, your top laws, like God's laws here. And if you see anybody at the top deviate from them, that, that's it, get them out. Yeah, yep, yep, absolutely. You should be about it, you know. Yeah. Well, I've heard, I've heard you mention before that uh, you know they, they talk about all these treaties and uh, how difficult it'd be to unravel them, and uh, I, I go along wholeheartedly with your own solution, and it could uh, keep you warm for many, many a year. Is that's a, a match? That's mm -hmm. all you need, and just uh, yeah. burn them. That's it. <laughs> Game yeah. over. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that's uh, we've reached the end. Uh, speedy two hours there, and. Uh, well, thanks very much, and uh, we'll we'll talk uh, we'll talk off air about um, what's coming up next. Yeah, sure enough, it's been a pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Cheers.